Again, thank you all for being here tonight. And this is part of our On the Same Page collection. Um, this is a bi-monthly read that the library has been doing for 17 years. And if you can believe, this is the first time we've had a book of poetry as one of the selections. And so every, every two months, our Reader's Advisory Committee, and we plan way in advance, so we're, we're done until the new year picking our books. Um, we order many, many copies, and you can find the books at all of your branch locations. You should be able to walk in and pick up the book. So please take note of this. Um, if you didn't know that we had this, it's an amazing uh, read. And we have a book club, uh, my first book club of poetry. And I was amazed. It was such a great group. So check out the book club, come to the author event, and it happens every bi-monthly. All right, our library would like to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramutush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramutush community. And I'm gonna go ahead and throw in the chat box right now a great, you know, us librarians, we love making reading lists. So here's a great resource where you can find books and websites on indigenous culture, particularly in our Bay Area. And if you don't know what territory you're joining us from, you can use this great map that is very interactive and talks about any treaties that are in place or were in place. And then in news this week, the Segorte Land Trust all women led group in Berkeley has received a gift of a parcel of land from the Berkeley Community Garden. It is, um, they have a really amazing uh, system set up called the Shumi Tax, but this was a great straight up gift given to their land trust. So check out Segorte Land Trust, they're an amazing group of women. Tomorrow night in the virtual library, we have author Emily St. John Mandel in conversation with Annalie Newitz, and they'll be talking about St. John Mandel's new book, Sea of Tranquility. And she is the author of Stations 11, the very popular book and HBO TV series. So come check that out. And then on the same page, right after Natalie Diaz comes Melinda Lowe, and this will be part of our celebration for AANHPI month. We've changed it up a little and part of Pride in June. So Melinda Lowe will be in combo in June and we'll have the book club in June. A very great book. It is a young adult book, which is also a, a new pick for us too. We don't do too many of those, but it is so good. Very San Francisco. Check it out. May 20th at our latest newest bookstore, Medicine for Nightmares, we feature Nomadic Press and their new tarot deck, Pandemic and Revolution. Lots of artists, lots of poets. May 12th, uh, commemoration to Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Kim Schuck, our Poet Laureate, will be doing this. And that's going to be in person. Yeah, we're doing it. We are having in person. Come see us. This is in our, our main Latino community room in the lower level of the main library. All right. Thank you again all for being here. I'm very excited tonight to have these two amazing badass women amongst us. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Um, tonight we are here to celebrate the work of Pulitzer Prize winning poet Natalie Diaz, and she's going to be in conversation with educator and author Michelle Cruz Gonzalez. Postcolonial Love Poem is the winner of the 2021 Pulitzer Prize is a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award and a finalist for the 2020 Forward Prize for Best Collection, among others. Natalie Diaz was born and raised in the Fort Mojave Indian Village in Needles, California, on the banks of the Colorado River. She is a Mojave and enrolled member of the Gila River Indian Tribe. Her first poetry collection, When My Brother Was an Aztec, was published by Copper Canyon Press in 2012. She is the 2018 MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a Lannanan Literary Fellow, and a Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellow. She was awarded the Breadloaf Fellowship 
the Holmes National Poetry Prize, a Hoder Fellowship, and a Penn Chivatelli Ranieri Foundation Residency, as well as being awarded a U.S. Artist Board Fellowship. Diaz teaches at the Arizona State University in the Creative Writing and MFA program. And Michelle Cruz Gonzalez as our Bay Area representative, yay. And she is an English professor and author of the memoir, The Spit Boy Rule, Tales of Chicana, Tales of a Chicana in a Female Punk Band, which is taught in colleges and universities all over the United States. She has written essays and fiction in anthologies by Putnam, PM Press, Seal Press, and Literary Kitchen, and has published in Long Reads, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Latino Rebels, and Me Too. She's recently completed a satirical novel about near future California that secedes from the US and forces intermarriage between whites and Mexicanos for the purpose of creating a race of beautiful, intelligent, hardworking people. And she is currently working on a screenplay, which I cannot wait to, to read both of those. All right, I am gonna go ahead and stop sharing and turn it over to our amazing humans. Take it away. Hi everybody, hi Natalie, and welcome um, to this event and um, welcome to San Francisco, Natalie, <laughs> virtually, right? First of all, I wanna say salute and congratulations. I know you have a little drinky shink over there. So let's clink to the screen, Dink. Salud, y amor. Salud. This is amazing. So um, I think the best way to start off, well, I got a drink after you say salud, right? The best way to start off um, a discussion about a Pulitzer Prize winning collection of poetry is to hear a little bit about it. But I do want to point out first that you're the first Latina to win this prize and the first Latinx person since William Carlos Williams won in 1963. I mean, and folks, <laughs> he, was, he was Latino. <laughs> and people don't realize he was Latino. Like, I know. So, you know, and, and I, I was, I, I was thinking about him because, you know, I teach American literature and I've taught his work and he, he's kind of a white, semi-white passing guy too. So it's easy to forget that he's, that he's Latino. But um, that was 1963, people. So here we are, 2022, and finally a Latina wins Pulitzer Prize. So we got to hear a little bit of this. So let's, let's, let's hear what you chose to start off with. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just com coming off of COVID, so my voice is a little strange. Um, but I think especially because we're talking about Latinas, Latinx, um, I'm going to read a poem called Ode to the Beloved's Hips, just for all our ancestors and their hips. <clears throat> Cadena. <laughs> <laughs> Ode to the beloved's hips. Bells are they shaped on the eighth day. Silvered percussion in the morning are the morning swing, switch, sway, hold the day away a little longer, a little slower, a little easy. Call to me, I wanna rock, I, I wanna rock, I, I wanna rock right now. So to them I come, struck dumb, chime blind, tolling with a throat full of Hosanna. How many hours bowed against this infinity of blessed trinity? Communion of pelvis, sacrum, femur, my mouth, terrible angel, everlasting novena, ecstatic devourer. Oh, the places I have laid them, knelt and scooped the amber, fast honey from their openness, Amuzin Cobb's hidden temple of Tulum, licked smooth the sticky of her hip, heat thrummed also coxy, lambent slave to ilium and ischium, I never tire to shake this wild hive, split with thumb the sweet dripped comb, hot hexagonal hole, dark diamond to its nectar dervished queen, may nad tongue come Hum drunk, hum tranced honey puller. For her hips, I am strummed, song, and succubus. They are the sign, hip, and the cosine, a great book, the body's Bible opened up to its good news gospel. Alleluia's, Ave Maria's, Madre Mia's, Ay, 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 Dios mios, and hip, hip, hooray. 
Cult of Cossack's Culto de Cadera, Oracle of Orgasm, Rorschach's Riddle, What Do I See? Hips, Innominate Bone, Wishbone, Orpheus Bone, Transubstantiation Bone, Hips of Bread, Wine, Wet Thighs, Say the Word and Healed I Shall Be, Bone Butterfly, Bone Wings, Bone Ferris Wheel, Bone Basin, Bone Throne, Bone Lamp, Apparition in the Bone Grotto, Sixth Mystery, Slick Rosary Bead, Deme la Gracia of a Decade in this Garden of Carmine Flower, Exile me to the enormous orchard of Alcinas, spiced fruit, laden tree, in paradise me, because God, I am guilty. I am sin frenzied and full of teeth for pear upon apple upon fig. More than all that are your hips. They are a city. They are kingdom. Troy, the hollowed horse, an army of desire. Thirty soldiers in the belly, two in the mouth. Beloved, your hips are the war. At night your legs, love, are boulevards, leading me beggared and hungry to your candy house, your baroque mansion, even when I am late and the tables have been cleared in the kitchen of your hips, let me eat cake. O oh, constellation of pelvic glide, every curve, a luster or star, more infinite still, your hips are cosmic, our universe, galactic carousel of burning comets and big, big bangs, millennium falcon, let me be your solo. O oh, hot planet, let me circumambulate. O oh, spiral galaxy, I am coming for your dark matter. Along las calles de tus muslos I wander, follow the parade of pulse like a drumline, descend into your plaza de toros, hands throbbing miura bulls, dark isleros, your arched hips, I mi torera, down the long corridor your wet walls lead me like a traje de luces, all glitter glowed, I am the animal born to rush your rich red muletas, each breath, each sigh, each groan, a hooked horn of want, my mouth at your inner thigh. Here I must enter you, mi pobre Manolete. Press and part you like a wound. Make the crowd mm -hmm. pounding in the grandstand of your iliac crest rise up in you and cheer. Gracias. Gracias for having me and um, gracias Anissa also for all the things librarians do. So uh, <laughs> li the li my library at home saved me and it was the one place with air conditioning. So right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, speaking of air conditioning, I'm really glad I have my Dyson fan on me right now because woo, um, <laughs> that was that was spicy. That was hot. That was really hot. So I'm really glad you started with that piece because um, it sets up a lot of things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the code meshing in your writing. I want to talk about the sensuality. I want to talk about the word choice. And um, I also want to just talk about the love part. I'm going to save this for the end because it's more upbeat. I want to talk about the love part about of the post-colonial love poem in particular. I want to end there, but so so we'll we'll, we'll circle back to this. Um, but um, I want to start just by starting off our discussion by talking about the combination of references that you choose in your pieces and and how poetry is. To me, like the best poetry is the poetry that makes use of words and references references and images that feel like surprises. Like when you read it, you go, ah, uh, I've never thought of it that way. That's perfect. Um, words like surprises that that just jump off the page that um, that really take your breath away. And um, I, you know, early in the collection when I started reading it in, in preparation, um, because I got my first copy from the San Francisco Public Library, they sent me this. Um, I had read um, your first collection um, before, and I hadn't had this one yet, so they sent this to me. So when I start, first started reading it, one of the very early poems in the piece, um, Bloodlight does that thing for me um, of surprising me with language and references. And so, um, um, and I, I kind of want to use this discussion here to also get into a little bit, a little discussion. We don't want to need to go too far about talking about literary um, devices as well. So you often use assonance in this, in this particular piece, Bloodlight, you use assonance a lot, consonance, cacophony, um, you know, cacophony is unmelodious sharp. These are kind of like literary, you know, lit nerd, <laughs> lit nerd devices. And 
you know, these are probably things that you, you can learn them through the definitions, right? And we, as, as writing teachers, we teach the definitions to students, but the, the definitions I remember when I was learning these, I don't really stick that well, right? Like they're better when you learn them, when you read writing that uses these devices over and over again. And that's when you really start to kind of internalize how to use them and what they mean and what they can do for your writing. So um, I, the first point in this collection where I, I literally like caught my breath was in Bloodlight where, where you say, um, and I'd like you to read some of this. I weep alacranes, the scorpions clatter to the floor like yellow metallic scissors. And um, I, I, I almost fell on the floor when I read that. So just maybe you could just talk about literary devices and, you know, read a, read a ch um, section of this, however you want to do it, just take it away. Someone said, yes, me too. They almost fell on the floor. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll read up until there. And then I, I appreciate you opening the door for me to walk through that. Um, mm -hmm. Bloodlight. My brother has a knife in his hand. He has decided to stab my father. This could be a story from the Bible if it wasn't already a story about stars. I weep alacranes. The scorpions clatter to the floor like yellow metallic scissors. They land upside down on their backs and eyes, but writhe and flip to their segmented bellies. Um, and I mean, so some of the language you're talking about, like, um, I, I mean, for me, it's, it's very much body, right? Like we, we dislocate sensuality and we turn it into the senses, which become like the mind's eye. So very ocular centric and this kind of intellectual, like, I'm, I'm really interested in like the craft, like you were saying, like sometimes those, those terms don't stick yeah. because they're, they're happening up here. But like, if we can, if we can recognize that, that a poem actually happens in the body, right? Like everything happens in the body, our thoughts happen in the body. Um, and I think that's something I trust. Like I, I talk a lot with my, st my students and, you know, and, and my students are adult. I mean, they're adults. I think there's something right. that kind of turned back downward on them, but they're poets, they're writers, they're, they're imaginers, they're the makers of what will come next. Um, and we talk a lot about like, son like the sonic, like I, I tell them like, you don't, you don't have to worry about the sonic if you trust your body. Um, and, and, and I think, because I think sonic, again, it, it's, <laughs> controlling what is like the mind and also it's it's pretending the ear is the center of that sensuality and, and and of course like we know that people have many different sensualities like you know people who are deaf or or who who just read the world and, and sense the world differently but I think for me that is something I trust like um, you know I weep alacranes the scorpions clatter to the floor like yellow metallic scissors and and what I was trying to to think about was like the the tenuousness that I feel when my real life brother is in a crisis or when my family is in a state of emergency or when I know there is danger. It's a feeling I've known since I was little growing up where I did and in the family I did. And like you're so attuned and alert and it's not just your ear, it's your eye, it's, it's your skin sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes your skin tells you the danger is coming before you know. And I, of course, I also play basketball. So like for me, like thinking about periphery, like I, I have incredible periphery, like vision, but I think my body also reads it. Like I feel like my back reads things. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that's something I think a lot about is like, I didn't have to think about the, the sounds because I was thinking about how my body was alert and sensual to what was happening. So, so the verbs come, the actions come, the images come. And, and I, I just, tr I trust that. And I, I mean, I know that might sound trivial because I think trust is a weird word. I think, but, but I guess like I have a very different body sensuality because I grew up in the desert because I grew up in a big family because I play basketball. But I, but I think if we can relocate or refine all the things our body knows and you know, whether they're pleasures or fears, I think they have the same kind of sensuality. Um, so, so I guess that's where I'll join you with that, that I think about it in that way. And you had mentioned surprise. And I think the real joy and luck of, of a poem or even a sentence, language in general, is that it doesn't happen linearly. I think, I think when surprise happens, it's because 
we realize that the trajectory doesn't exist, that knowledge is actually happening everywhere outside of the line. And, and so what that does is it sparks these things that, mm -hmm. that become like the unknown. And I think maybe that's what we're all chasing. And, and sometimes we, we mess it up, we F it up by, by knowing, but it's the unknown, I think that, which again, periphery, thinking about that sensuality. Um, I'll stop there. I mean, it, you, what you're, you're making me like want to write. So I appreciate the question. <laughs> uh, well, I want to talk about how we fuck it up. I mean, academia fucks it up by going, okay, here's the list of literary devices. You know, take a test on this, remember these. And they're like, here's an example. You know, here's a list of examples of, you know, metonymy or cacophony or whatever. And then, um, you know, make sure you put these in your poem. And we, we say, you know, five sentence senses, yada, 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 but we don't allow, we teach writing from this, this word, this like a kind of a white word, academic ivory tower space. Right. And so that, that divorces us from from, yeah, someone said knowledge isn't linear, right? First of all, and it divorces people from their bodies and from the feelings and from trusting their, that their stories matter and that their positionalities are everything in a lot of ways in, in, in terms of what they can bring to the table and, and in, in the ways in which they can be unique. Yeah, and I mean, I think too, like thinking about like line linearity, right? Like w when knowledge is linear, it means it's silencing all of us who are not out, who are outside of whatever, like the controlled, like this means, this means this, this is currency. Um, and, and what's interesting to me about a line, especially in poetry is, you know, I, I think the poem happens far off the page. And, and I think something that's interesting to me is that is that the line becomes currency. Again, it's so ocular centric, it, it, it's, yeah. And I mean, I guess, I guess something that I, I will like kind of join you in, in, in thinking about, about this and in terms of, of, you know, what we say is writing is, I mean, I'm really interested in the page. Like, I would just wonder what, what this world would be like if the page wasn't white. <laughs> You know, because like <laughs> the because white like, space. Oh my god. Yeah, because well, it's it's true though, right? Because white is always good enough. Like, you know, it, it's imprecise. It's so imprecise. It drives me crazy when it's like the white space or the the silence, and it's like what? Like what? What do you mean? You know, like and and so I try to like tell my students like it's a it's a body. Like it's not it's not flat and two dimensional, but we let it be because of course white light goodness. God, all the white things we've been told are like, you know, legit uh, humanity, for example. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think there's something interesting about that, about, about how we make and then the mediums which, which manifest as having made. So that, that I mean, isn't it, this is, a, this is a side problem I have, but I, I'm just so confounded by the fact that the only time we ever see an 8.5 by 11 inch page is in when my students have to turn things in. And that's crazy. Like I've never read an 8.5 by 11 inch book. And it's like, why, why do we keep, anyway, I will go sideways quickly on that. But I guess, I guess I'm interested in, in that, in like what, what, what we tell ourselves and what we reify about, about knowledge that keeps the rest of us out or keeps true knowledge or other older knowledge systems from happening. Uh oh. Yeah. One of your colleagues, um, Asao B. Inoue talk, uses that, um, his kind of like, he frames kind of some of what we're talking out about is howling, the habits of white language. Um, everyone should look that up, habits of white language. And it's, it's an amazing framework and it, it kind of, it, it really does address a lot of what we're talking about here right now. So, um, I also wanted to talk about the use of references or visuals that are not so commonplace. So like a lot of times, you know, as writers, we use references from our environment, from our positionalities, our lived experiences. 
Um, I wasn't surprised to see that that you're also a linguist um, after I read the poetry collection because I knew there was there was like a piece that I was like, where does this? There was there kind of felt like there was a subset of like words or styling that I was like I couldn't quite place. And then when I when I read that you were a linguist, I was like, mm, okay, I think this might might have something to do with that. But um, one thing that struck me was um, I, I wanted to know how you um, how you conjure how you conjure details like how how what is that process like and um and then I was struck by this thing of like <laughs> I'm gonna pick on literary literary circles a little bit <laughs> like you know how in, in um in different literary scenes there's like a word that becomes the popular word that all the poets use <laughs> I felt like when I was reading your poems I was like, like anaphora <laughs> or S or I wrote one down yeah that one and um Oh gosh, sinew, sinew, sinew was the big one in our lit scene, and I thought like you're narwhal was for a while. Nar oh my gosh! So I felt like you're the poet who might use the word that everyone else like. When I was <laughs> reading your poetry, I was like, maybe she's she's she strikes me as one of the poets who uses the word first, and then everyone else starts copying. Um, I will never use sinew in an sinew in an essay ever. Um, so, but maybe you could just talk about, you know, to get a little more serious, like how do you conjure details? What is that process like? Um, you know, just you know, a little bit about for people who are thinking about like where this, where these ideas comes from. And I know, you know, writing is also for me, a very spiritual process as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we're all probably linguists, you know, again, it's like, now I'm like yeah. obsessed with knowledge. I teach classes about knowledge, like anti-knowledge or beyond knowledge. Um, but I mean, I think in some way, right? Like, I mean, who were the first linguists? Come on, you know? And like, I think my elders are linguists, meaning like, yeah. they like, they live in a word, like they, there's a field in the words. They can sow the field, tend the field, harvest the field, feed us through the field of a single word, right? Um, but I guess, I guess for me, like, I, I think some of it is, some of it, I guess it's just how I was raised in the desert and in a very big family in a very small space. Um, on the res where your neighbors or your family, you yeah. know, um, and playing basketball. And so for me, like, like language is physical. That's, that's how I grew up thinking about language. It, it's the body. You know, land is the body, water is the body. Mm -hmm. I am the land. like, and I think there's something about, and this will be, this is interesting. Then you're making me think of this now. So I, like, you've brought me into a new space of this. Like, is that I, I think the one of the lucky things is that I don't necessarily like believe in metaphor. I mean, I know, I know you can make metaphor, but the mm -hmm. ways I believe, my beliefs are not actually metaphorical. And I think maybe that's something very freeing about language, you know? And so like, in order to say like, I carry a river in my body. Well, everyone's like, that's a metaphor. And I'm like, it's not, I don't, I don't know how to explain that it's not, but it, it's like a closeness I have with, with my land and water, but it's the same way I like that closeness is the way I love, like a lover, a friend, you know, the way I come to strangers, the way I arrive any place. And so I think, I think in terms of that, like the lexicon, like I, I use the word lexicon a lot. We all have one. It's just we've been dragged away from it again because we're supposed to say things that have currency or have value. But who do they have value to, you know? And so, you know, I think of the revolt of the cockroach people often where it says like where he says, like, in order to be successful, you have to go. So you have to leave your family. You have to leave everything behind in order to be mm -hmm. successful. Most of us, right? And, and, and that's, I think, also with language. Like in order to be legible and to be understood, we have to often move so far away from the words that have meaning to us. Like the words that mean love, for example. Even if they're scarce when you grow up, even if they're scarce in your household, there are words that, that mean, that have like high stakes, right? Sometimes those stakes are like life, death, violence, care, loneliness, right? But we get so far away from them in order to, to be heard, 
by, mm-hmm. by like the larger, you know, like white American imagination and like the white American ear, like in order for it mm-hmm. to hear you and make sense of you or, or quote, yeah. understand you. And so I, it just feels like it's weird to, it's weird in one way to say like, it's lucky to grow up on the res, but, but we just had each other and that's who like our language had to only mean to each other. Um, which in some ways was not great, you know, there's a lot of violence there. And, and also in other ways, like, I think it's just taught me that, yeah, that, I mean, there's something about not being legible. And so like, I guess the last thing I'll say, because I've heard people say this about my work in that, um, that my work is difficult because I use a lot of words, a lot of like Latin it or, but I mean, that, that's such a narrow such a narrow, ridiculous perspective because one, as if I couldn't learn the English language and as if I couldn't, uh, you know, as if like, as if any of us couldn't learn the English language, but also like, I think there's two things I'll I'll say and then I'll stop is that one, the, the English language is not enough for the majority of us. And it was designed that way. Like it was designed for us not to bloom in it. Shut us out. Yeah, very intentionally. And shut us up. And so like like, that language is like, we have to put it in excess sometimes, right? For me, that's the love poem. Like I I need it to be in excess so that I and my beloveds can exist. And then the last little tap I'll make is that I put English next to my Mojave language. And that's that's what happens when I put English in its youngness and its limit, limitedness next Mm -hmm. to Mojave which mm-hmm. is immense and resounding, like English has to fracture and be many things. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, you're speaking my language over here because there's, you know, I, I'm involved in this, in a movement at the community college level. It's, it's really rather taken on a, a large role and it's a linguistic justice movement. And it, it's, it's, it's whole goal is to deprivilege standard edited American English in academic writing and to privilege all the Englishes in academia, in essays. And code meshing is one of the main tool writing from your positionality, even if that means in a more standardized way, writing from your positionality, using storytelling, um, finding your authentic voice, um, using a variety of Englishes, all the Englishes at your disposal and putting them all together to make something that's uniquely you, your idiolect. Um, and so, um, you know, the code meshing in the book is really, it was really one of my absolute favorite parts, you know, it wasn't just one code or two codes, it was three. And, and, and I would argue more than more than three codes. Um, I think there are, there are elements of your writing that are codes that are not just words. Um, so I, I wanted to set that up and talk about the code meshing, but I did want to go back and say, do you know how we say love in my house? In my house, the way we say we love you is I ask everybody when I see them, because I wake up before everybody, I say, you waked it up. Mm-hmm. And that means I'm glad you're awake and you didn't die. And I love you. You waked it up. And it's a very like, you know, like baby talk. And we are, we are, we waked it up. Yes, I waked it up. Um, so, yeah. And all families have these these ways of speaking that that is a, that is their own love language is very um, standard, um, and it it speaks to what you were talking about earlier the limits of the English language. You know, we we reinvent and we reshape it because it's it is so limited, um, especially for those of us who speak a variety of other languages. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know how it like shuts down, like you know, like like for example, in Mojave, you don't say, "Are you hungry?" You just feed somebody. But even so, so you just offer what you have, like you feed, mm-hmm. you feed them as soon as they come mm-hmm. in. And even right. that, I think, is a part of what you're saying is this like mm-hmm. that, that the control of having to have the language voice something in a specific way, whereas mm-hmm. love is happening in and, and love that's not that is many things. Right. Sometimes it's care. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's nourishment. You know, sometimes it's protection. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's defense. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, what you just said just reminded me of that. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you mm-hmm. sharing it. Yeah. So um, speaking of code meshing and um, different Englishes, um, 
you know, in addition to the Pulitzer, you also in 2018 won the MacArthur Genius Award. And, you know, I'm thinking about our students and the idea of genius awards. And it makes me think of how so many, and you, you hinted at this earlier, so many of our students are geniuses. It's just that they're not encouraged to access or highlight their cultural wealth to believe in the power of stories and storytelling or their positionalities or to find, they're not encouraged to find and cultivate their authentic voices and code mesh. And I believe that there's actually a direct relationship between these unfortunate last aspects of, of, of um, European colonization and assimilation model, assimilationist model of education, of course, and the way that mostly BIPOC writers are treated in publishing as creators of low art or novelties or exceptions. Um, you know, that whole thing where it just kind of seems like there's only one, only there can only be one native writer at a time. There can only be one, you know, black writer. There can, you know, one Latinx writer. Um, what can institutions do to better celebrate the broad levels of talents that exist in, in POC communities and, and those students at their, at their institutions? That's really what I want to ask. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about one, like the problem is diversity, right? That that word we should just get rid of it, you know, yeah. it's a gesture, it's a gesture, it's an initiative, right? Um, and we hear, we hear already. Yeah, well, and also like diversity means they're keeping us to a certain number. Like what's what's fucking crazy about the math of diversity is that all of us who are not considered white we're all considered one diverse body. I mean, even being indigenous, being Native, we're so we're so different from tribe to tribe, right? And, and from people to people, and like, but we're just one. Like we become, you know, the the melting pot, right? Like that yeah. ridiculous melting pot. But I, I mean, something I pressure a lot, and and I'm lucky because you know ASU is a, I, I teach at Arizona State University. It's a mm-hmm. largest research one university. It's, it's a mammoth of a place, a, a machine. Mm-hmm. And you know, and you you wonder how much of what you're pushing back against actually fuels the machine. You know, like there's mm-hmm. some there's they need some they need some of us to push back right so that they can continue. It's, it reminds me of like how wave a wave builds. Mm-hmm. You know, there's that. There's the pressure that must come so that this can come and crest over and eventually. Yeah. Come. But I, I mean, I think a lot and I challenge like, I, I say challenge. Sometimes that just means speaking up. And I, I realize like I, I'm really lucky that some of the things that, that have happened to me are legible to, to the, the larger like world that doesn't usually include natives and queer people and Latinx people, you know, and so I'm lucky in that res- in that sense, but also I do feel like there's like a responsibility. Like my elders say, my elders say like, when you have a gift, you have to use it. Like it's not mm-hmm. it's not a f- frivolous thing. It's it's not you know it means that you have a role now and you have an energy given to you. And it doesn't mean I, I'm saying I'm gifted, but but I, I have a lot. I'm lucky. This, this is like the problem with the translation gift and luck in, in English don't yeah. mean what they mean in, in, in my home. Yeah. And so I feel like one of the things I try always to do and is, is that I, I don't let people get away with saying diversity. And I try hard not to let people get away with just saying whiteness generically. Like I want you to be specific because like whiteness doesn't cut it because people get away with, you know, or like racist, who's a racist anymore? Like nobody is, right? Like, which is weird. Um, but I think like for me, I, I try hard to pressure the idea that that diversity is not about race. It's about creative excellence. And and like I'm not asking you to make less white people here. I'm saying bring more excellent people here. And if you want to bring more excellent people here, they're they're us like, you know, they're they're all the different ways that we can be like you're saying these languages, right? Like it's it's these like there is no language without all the languages, you know? And so like, it's this kind of status quo, this standardized, this norm, which I think is why the work you're doing is, is really important and that, that pressure you're putting. Because I think, you know, like, I don't want to decolon. I mean, maybe other people do. This is just not, I don't want to decolonize the university. It, I don't know that it can be, but I just say like, why not let people tremble? 
You know, like why not like, you know, why not find a way that that we can figure out like how my students can be their full selves and imagine their full lives and also recognize that the university might not ever be able to handle that, you know, because most of this country can't. And so I guess that's something that I think a lot about with, with my students is that mm-hmm. I, for me, the investment is po- in poetry is not a prize ever, which they're, ar- they're arbitrary in some ways. I, I mean, I, they, they become currency. They become very literal currency. Mm-hmm. I have a very good job and I get treated very well because of po- poems, which is weird. However, like what I mean by that is like, you just never know who's going to, who's going to value what you've said as being like up to their standard. And so like, for me, like my investment in poetry is that it makes my life different. Like I, I act different. It makes me continually rethink what I think I mean or what I think Mm -hmm. I understand or what I think I have to offer or, you know, what is generosity? So I went Mm -hmm. on a little bit of a tangent there, but yeah, it's, it's tough, right? Because like our students are in the, I mean, they're in those positions where like the currencies matter to them, you know, like what comes next to them is like, who's on the other side of a scholarship or who's on the other side of a job app. And mostly like, unfortunately, like mostly assholes, right? Like mostly people who, who already know, and they're already projecting who our students are. Or who are. haven't really done the work, who've cheated their way the whole time. <laughs> that yeah, makes me you know? nuts. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah, I think, yeah, I think what you're asking is like, it's important. And like, it's something that I want to always ask myself, like Same. The, the, the what, the how or what next or, mm-hmm. you know, or, you know, yeah, like what might this look like next or, or like as soon as, as soon as things start to feel comfortable, you know, you should worry, right? When you're in the institution, like, exactly. which is difficult because it's a, it's an emotional labor. Yeah. You no, know? like some people get to go home and chill and play video games or watch their shows. And you're sitting here stressing, like my student needs surgery or like my student yeah. I to home to, you know, Puerto Rico. Over Why the didn't this one there. student turn in these two stories yeah. and now I'm trying to t- contact him and he's like, I've had anxiety this whole time. And I'm like, wait a minute. I thought maybe I should have reached out sooner. And like, ah, you know, all yeah, this. Yeah. No, it's just, yeah. I hear you. Um, so a lot of us do. So, so this is, this is so good. So I do want to get to, I do want to talk a little bit about run and gun and um, I want to hear, I, well, first of all, I'd actually like to hear American arithmetic, which I think is really related in a lot of ways. Um, we do a better job of dying by police than living. And I love that turn at the end of this poem. Um, so there, I think there's a relationship to the, to the, vi- to the, to the, to the d- misunderstanding about language and people and commu- certain communities. And, and so we could talk about that after, after you read. Yeah, yeah. And this for me was like how to challenge the statistic, which is a large, it's like majority of the way indigenous people show up in in policy is just as a statistic. Um, and the and, statistics you use explained at the back of the book. I love that, that you added yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So and the, I'll just front load the one thing is that when I'm, I mean, I say per capita. So what I mean is by population, how many of us based on our population and so what that means of percentage but um american arithmetic native americans make up less than one percent of the population of america 0.8 percent of 100 percent oh mine efficient country I do not remember the days before america I do not remember the days when we were all here Police kill Native Americans more than any other race. Race is a funny word. Race implies someone will win, implies I have as good a chance of winning as who wins the race that isn't a race. Native Americans make up 1.9% of all police killings, higher per capita than any race. Sometimes race means run. I'm not good at math. Can you blame me? I've had an American education. We are Americans and we are less than 1% of Americans. We do a better job of dying by police than we do existing. When we are dying, 
who should we call? The police or our senator? Please, someone, call my mother. At the National Museum of the American Indian, 68% of the collection is from the United States. I am doing my best to not become a museum of myself. I am doing my best to breathe in and out. I am begging, let me be lonely, but not invisible. But in an American room of 100 people, I am Native American. Less than one, less than whole, I am less than myself. Only a fraction of a body. Let's say I am only a hand. And when I slip it beneath the shirt of my lover, I disappear completely. Thank you. Thank you. So before we take some questions, I just want to, I just wanted to point out a couple things and, and, um, let's see, <laughs> I have so many things that I wanted to say. Um, so I do, I want to, I'm going to circle back to this, to this idea, to the, to the ending, to the turn at the end of this poem. Um, the line, I slip beneath the shirt of my lover, I disappear completely. Let's come back to that. Um, but I do also want to just um, ruminate for a second on, I learned to play basketball. I learned to play ball, run and gun. I learned to play ball on the res, on outdoor courts where the sky was our ceiling. That line just really had me reeling. The sky was our ceiling. I, I read it over and over again. And I just, it, it brought me so many, like it had so many meanings for me. It was like beautiful, the idea of the sky the image of the sky as the ceiling juxtaposed with the raggedy court, knowing that there is no actual ceiling and the, assim the idea of, of basketball as a white sport that was actually, you know, kind of comes from an indigenous sport, the kind of the assimilation, that's all the assimilation that's going on, the references to, the, to colonization. And so I wanted, I want you to talk about the turn at the last poem that's related here at, as we kind of go out onto the Q and A. Um, and talk about the title of the, the book and the, the recurring post-colonial love as salve that, that is kind of a theme that runs throughout. It's like your, it's your sana, sana, colita de rana, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, so maybe you can talk about that um, as we go out before questions. Yeah. Si no sana soy, sanarás mañana. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by that time, I'd be like... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel like after my first book, especially, like I felt very, um, I was very set on, on love, on like my capacity. Mm -hmm. Like I've said this in other talks, but like, you know, I wanted the first body at stake because I do feel like there are stakes to language. Language has stakes. Um, mm -hmm that I wanted my body to be the first body at stake, you know? Um, and that's like a very personal thing between me, you know, like, hey, I am capable of love. You know, I'm capable of being loved, I'm capable of offering it. Which are things you're not taught, right? Because you're, not, you're taught that violence can't exist with love. You're taught yeah. that, you know, the wound cannot exist with blooming. You're, you know, so because like this binary, which is why again, like poetry feels like an important medium because it's, it's out of time. It's not linear, you know, language, it's an energy that's happening across numerous planes, right? So like, like even for me, like the surprise in a poem is that, is not that the poem moves like this, but that there's also a line behind it. Mm, exactly. And then there's a line here. And so like you end up with these planes that are happening in all these different directions because it's energy and it's, it's physical. Um, but I, th I think for me, like in American arithmetic, like at the bottom of that poem, it's like, um, you know, let's say I am only a hand because it, it, you can't, you can't fathom what it's like to grow up in this, to wake up in the morning in the United States and to be native. And like, when I first realized, I mean, I knew I grew up on the res. I, we were res kids. Like I knew it, like we got bust off the res people, 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 when people drove us home from like basketball games, it's like, you know, yeah. oh, she lives on the res. But that didn't mean anything until I got old enough where I'm like, oh, fuck, like, this is what a reservation is? Like, 
it, you, do, you know, like it just rearranges your brain. Like, wait, this is, I'm from like, and I can't even explain it. Like when you realize, like when you start, when you first realize like, oh, I'm from a res, like this is what a res was for. Or like, wait, I'm like, I'm native American. Like, what does that mean? Um, and I, I have think- a sense. I have a strong sense as I grew up near a res and I was in it. My mom made me go to Indian club, even though I wasn't me Um She was like, you're indigenous too. Well, you should go to Indian club. We, yep. It's the land. It's about, it's about land. Really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and, and, you know, and even that, right. Even like who we let be indigenous, which is about relationship, yeah. about laborious relationship, right. Mm-hmm. Not like this blanket, like relationality. We're all related. We're all human beings. It's like, no, that's not. That's not it. Cause I think actually some people are like alien to what life is mm-hmm. anti-life even, but, but yeah, I think for me, it, it was like, love is that like the love poem has become for me, it's the excess that was not imagined for me or my beloveds or even my strangers. Right. Like I think like my strangers are sometimes the most important to me, you know, those who I don't know yet, or who I always say like who I don't love yet. Like those are the those are the people exactly. like mm-hmm. where I will arrive because they'll I'll be more by the time I get there. Um, but I guess like, you know, I mean, you've been so generous and like even like you're making me think in ways I haven't. So I, I you know, gracias mil. Um, but that, yeah, like that last line, like and, and, you know, let's say I'm only a hand like because you it's like, wait a minute, like, what does it mean that I'm that there are that few of us? And, and I know this from my family, like, especially after COVID, there are even fewer of us, right? Like what, what, it, what that means. And so, and you know, like when you lose a single like elder, what you yeah. lost, right? And, and even the fact that you can't, you don't even know what you've lost because you, you never had a chance to get there. But, you know, like that move, say, let's say I'm only a hand. And when I slip it beneath the shirt of my lover, I disappear completely. And, and, you know, like that was, that was a surprise for me, that moment. And, and I say it was a surprise because it, I didn't have to know it, but it was a complexity that, that I need to exist in that I disappear completely, but, but I disappear in ecstasy perhaps. Right. Mm -hmm. So to disappear in ecstasy means like I'm beyond the surveillance of this country. I'm now beyond the statistic because I've disappeared from that statistic in a space of pleasure or in a space of the ecstatic or in the space of like, like love that, that, that I know many Americans see as like clandestine, right. Or like unlove or like whatever. Um, but, but then it, but then it's also like very clearly about the fact that like, the illegibility, right? Like that it does have to be a hidden kind of love or, or that it like the difference between public and private or, or public private or private public or public intimate. Um, but for me that that's like the great question of the book. And, and it's a question primarily to myself, which is like, you know, like, Hey, you, you are capable of this. Like, and, and I, I mean, you know, it, this might seem like, like a cloud like or or idealistic but i mean i i have learned to love myself better in poetry i mean i learned to love myself better playing basketball it's like i learned the beauty of my body playing basketball i trust my body more than i trust anything else like ne- i've never trust my intellect but my body it's just been the thing i've been able to rely on you know and so poetry for me is that it's like a place where you know i love myself better in that i can i can write a love poem Like how fucking lucky is that? And then I love my brother better in a poem than I have been able to in real life for a very long time, you know? So, um, yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know there's probably a lot of questions who were, um, this was, I could, I could say lots and lots more. And I, I do have so much to say about that line in run and gun. It took me like everywhere, but, um, that's for another day. And, um, questions Anissa she has them for us I do thank you so much what a wonderful conversation um goosebumps all around (laughs) right um so I'll start with an easy one maybe maybe um what women's basketball teams are you rooting for Natalie Uh, Dawn Staley South Carolina that's who I was rooting for (laughs) all right all right 
And then can you talk a little bit about your love of Greek mythology? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe more than love, right? I feel like it's a really great pressure point because um, it's the mythology that's been accepted as knowledge, right? Roman and Greek mythology, it's like classics. We study it. Our students have to study it. And, and yet everything that I've been taught from my land and like, hey, we were created here. I can see my creation mountain. I know where we go when we die. That's called mythology, but in a very de-escalated way. And so I think for me, you know, because I was exposed to Greek mythology also, it was like, it's actually like one of the first books I found in the library were these like those giant Greek mythology books. So, and like the Norse gods and stuff. Like, I think I read like everything in my library. It was such a small library. Um, but I, I think it, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm looking at at the artwork behind you, Michelle, like, I mean, like we've been, like that's language, that's story, that's uh, heritage, that's, that's ancestors right mm -hmm. but it's always been flipped right like i was told like mojave creation myth and then this is history and my history book was like hunters and gatherers you know so it's like showing all i, I don't know where these natives were from in my history book they were very like yeah they were very um all general the general native um and so right. like i guess for me it was just a, a a pressure point like it was something i recognized as as like, okay, like, wait a minute, there's no such thing as truth within this binary of like history and mythology. And it was actually the most generous thing I could have realized early on is that what was being called myth was the way I knew stories to be told at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what was history just seemed like effed up and violent and un untrue, whatever, you know, so. I'm yeah, sure I trip on that word myth a lot. I, I always trip on it. I'm like, why, why do we, the, the connotations of it are just so odd to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All and, right. And we, we use it a lot, right? Like we, I, I think it gives people a, like a, it gives them space. Like when you say like personal myth, it gives you, you know, whether people say permission or, mm -hmm. you know, compels them to, but so, I mean, I think the word does have value. You yeah. Know? And I just like, I but think it's also used in a dismissive way a lot also. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, I, but, but I think if you go back to language, l language is mythical. It, it's never exact. It's the most it imprecise is. thing, it, but it's the close, I, closest I can get to you. Like the closest I can get to you, Michelle, right now is like, I'm saying a bunch of words, right. You know, or, you know, Anissa, like the, I'm, it's like, so weird that we traffic in language, right? I, I don't know. So, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, very interesting. All right. And one final question for you both. What hope and guidance thoughts can you offer to the next generation of BIPOC writers? <laughs> That's a big question. Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I always this is what I always say to my students. I'm gonna let, we're gonna let Natalie have the last word. What I always say is don't wait for some Columbus to come and discover you. You can publish your own writing. You can put out a zine. You can have a blog. Who, don't let anyone tell you blogs aren't cool anymore. You have social media, push that shit out on social media. You, you got all sorts of ways. There are all sorts of modern ways and there's also zines, there's lower, you know, lower technology. Um, you don't need to wait for someone to come and tell you that you're great or good. You don't even need to wait until you're great or good. You just want to write. You have ideas. Write. Do your thing. Get your ideas out there. Spread the good word. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> on that, but, um, I, I think, I guess something that I think about is that like, the, like language is physical and it, it is moving, it's happening. You know, it's, it's not mm -hmm. set, it's, it's an energy. And, and I think as much as like we, as much as we have language yet to be imagined, I also think there's a lot of old language that, that 
is waiting for us to come back to it or to arrive to it, right? This kind of with like outside of time. Um, and I think, I think something though that feels really important to me and I, I've been trying to talk a lot with, with my students but also like my colleagues, like my, my people out in the world is that like this country is not inevitable. And in its, its lang the English language is not inevitable, meaning we have, it, it's as capacious as any other energy. And like what I love to do is infuse the English language until it can't take it anymore and has to fracture or, or has to bloom or has to become something else. It's like press my indigenous language into yeah. it, you know? And so I, I think like there's something about, you know, what we're, t and this goes back, I think, Michelle, to what you were saying about the way we're taught, like we're taught what the hierarchical knowledge is, or we're taught this equals this and the product or the, the end or the plot, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there's something really important about understanding that like this, these structures are not inevitable. Um, and, and they're not inevitable because we're, we're here. You know, like I grew up on a reservation. I know what those were for. And here I am, you know, and here I am and capable of love, for example, but also like very capable of a fight, you know. And so I think that there's something about that, about that, that this country is not inevitable because of because we have something like language, you know, and whether that's verbal language or or the bodies from which that language will spring, you know, and so that's and it's something i have to remind myself about like i tell my students like you know and i say this to myself often like what is the language i need to live right now and it seems like a vague question but when i set myself to the task of it it, it makes me hold my people closer because that's the only reason why i have language it's not to speak back against the state but it's to find my people and to hold them close and so and to tell us about ourselves like what were possible uh, because so many people have told us about ourselves for so long. It's like, yeah. how do you not, how do you turn back to your people instead of just against, you know, these yeah, because who matters more, your people or the state? Yeah, word. We should in there. That's a good place. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Natalie Diaz, ah. Luis Gonzalez, for sharing your, you know, your yourself and your um, wisdom with the library community. I really appreciate that. I know our library community does too. And um, Michelle, definitely the community college community is also big in my heart as well. Um, friends, library community, love you. Thank you, Michelle, Natalie. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah, dream Thank well. Thank you so much. Hasta la próxima vez. Good night.